speaker today is uh, Miko Pellet, and he will be discussing his uh, his book and the story of his book, uh, which is his story, uh, The General Son, A Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. And we're very happy to have the book available um, in, in the back afterwards for, uh, for purchase and for signing. Um, you can also purchase uh, the book online at justworldbooks.com. Um, Miko is a writer and an Israeli peace activist living in San Diego. His father was the late General Madi Peled, and his grandfather signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence, and his niece was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. He's the co-founder of the El Benna Peled Foundation in memory of uh, Smadar Al Hanan and Abir uh, Aramin. He is a regular contributor to the on to online publications, including the Electronic Intifada uh, uh, and the Palestine Chronicle, and he maintains uh, a web blog at mikopeled. Uh, com. It's it's really uh, I'm lo really looking forward to uh, to this lecture and, and hearing Miko's perspective, uh, certainly a unique perspective, and so I hope you join me in in welcoming Miko. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all for being here this afternoon. I see most of you are a lot more sensible than I, and you're not wearing a suit. I think on my next visit to uh, D.C., I'll, I'll be better prepared when it comes to that, especially if it's in the summer. There's got to be something wrong with society that wears this and then turns on the air conditioning <laughs> and wastes all that energy. Something is wrong here. Um, I always begin my, I always be, like to begin my talk with a little disclaimer. And the disclaimer is the disclaimer is that if you came hoping to uh, or expecting to hear a balanced presentation, <laughs> then you may as well ask for your money back. This is not a balanced presentation. Frankly, I don't really believe a balanced presentation on this particular issue is possible. If anybody says that their presentation is balanced, I think they're either lying to themselves or lying to their audience. This is a very, very, very emotional, very complicated, very guttural issue. Um, whether you're Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, or not Jewish, really makes no difference. Many people who have never ever been there have strong opinions and strong feelings on this. And so um, for me, it's a very personal issue as well. Um, so I like to put that out front and up front, I should say, so that people don't come back later and say, yes, but he wasn't balanced. Well, he is not balanced. And like I said, I really don't believe anybody is on this issue. You know, I've been talking a lot and about the book and about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And you know the issue of Zionism is, is a big part of that, of course. My grandfather signed the Declaration of Independence. He was a Zionist leader. He immigrated to Palestine. He was a young Zionist back in the day, probably about a little, almost 100 years ago. And as we know, Zionism is the notion, or the move, was the movement, to allow Jewish people to return to their homeland. And the notion of Jewish people returning is quite acceptable when we talk about it to people today, certainly. Um, now, of course, these are not the same Jewish people who were exiled. It's not even their descendants, because they all died several thousand years ago. Uh, but it's people who claim Jewish heritage or connection to Jewish heritage, um, who were persecuted in Europe. Of course, there was a serious problem in, 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 in Christian Europe for Jews, as we know. And therefore, the notion of Zionism became more and more accepted, but today it's certainly acceptable. But somehow when we talk about the right of return of Palestinians, when we try to apply the same notion of return to Palestinians, people suddenly stand up and say, this is completely unacceptable, which is interesting. The Palestinians who were displaced uh, 65 years ago, many of them are still alive. Certainly their descendants are alive. So if they are allowed to return, we're talking about actual people who were displaced. And whether you think they were displaced or whether you think they left on their own, regardless, they had to leave their homes, their homes are there, you know, the right to return is something that we should respect. But somehow when we talk about the Palestinian issue, then this 
uh, even though there's a precedent with the Jewish, with you know, with Zionism, it is unacceptable. So there's a bit of a double standard here, really. You know, why is it okay for one nation to return, but not okay for another nation to return? And one of the claims that's made is, of course, that well, there's a demographic threat. If all these Arabs come into Israel, then that that, that, that constitutes a threat to Israeli Jews somehow. But as Jews were immigrating into Palestine, and then later when it became Israel into Israel, that didn't seem to bother anybody that there was a demographic threat being presented to the Palestinian population. And all the Jews immigrating into Palestine, into Israel over the last 65, 70 years, presented a serious demographic threat, but somehow that never appeared as an issue to others. So once again, this whole issue is somehow mired in double standard, in mythology, and I think in a serious lack of honesty. Now, the, one of the crowning, if not the crowning achievement of the Zionist movement was this. It was a decision by the United Nations or well, the resolution taken by the, by the United Nations in November of 1947 to partition Palestine into two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state. And this, was the, this is what it looks like. And the reason it was such a, a crowning achievement is because it's, it, it gave recognition to the right of Jews to have a homeland in their historical homeland, to have a state in their historical homeland. So this was a a very, very important diplomatic achievement for the Zionist movement. Now, the interesting thing is this. At the time, there were probably about half a million, the, the Jewish community con constituted about half a million people. The Palestinian Arab community constituted of about a million two, maybe a million three million, uh, people. So it was by far, far, by far the largest one, the larger of the two communities. Yet the United Nations felt that it was right to give the larger portion of the country to the smaller community, which is a little strange. And the expectation was that the Palestinian community would somehow accept this. I don't know what kind of an expectation this was or why anybody thought that would work. I think when you look at the map, it speaks for itself. It's an absurd situation that couldn't possibly have worked. But that's not the topic of, of today's uh, of, of, of my comments today. But I think this map really really demonstrates how difficult it was. Now the two communities were kind of uh, uh, somewhat on parallel lines. There were really two states in the making. In terms of the, um, or as far as the Jewish community goes, they, they managed to develop an education system, a healthcare system, an assembly, an executive branch. The, 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 you know, the assembly was elected. So there were all these, all the markings of a state to be, of a democratic state to be. Uh, my grandfather was uh, one of the founders of the of the health ministry, and you know, developed the developing the uh, healthcare system. And he was the de facto health minister at the time before the state was established. But the one thing that the Jewish community developed that the Palestinians didn't develop was a fighting force, was a militia. The Haganah and the Palmach constituted of many thousands of young men and women who were very well trained reasonably well equipped, and most importantly were very, very well indoctrinated. They were indoctrinated to believe in Zionism, to believe in the right of the Jewish people to return to their homeland, and in their role as deliverers, so to speak, of this right, of this land, back to the Jews. So then, after the United Nations gave its uh, approval for the creation of a Jewish state, this militia began an extensive campaign of ethnic cleansing to rid the country of its Arab population in order to create a Jewish majority, in order to create a state where a Jewish state that has as much of the land as possible with as little of the population as possible. Now the story is, and again we talk about the double standard and the lies and the mythology that has developed around this issue, the story is that the small Jewish community was attacked by Arab countries. 
the story also is that the Palestinians who were displaced left because their leaders had told them they had to leave, hoping to come back once they got rid of the Jews. And that somehow the small Jewish militia managed to fight off these Arab countries, fight off the threat, conquer the land, displace the people, destroy more than 500 towns and villages. All this while under attack by all these big Arab armies. And then when you take a look at what happened between the end of 1947 and the end of 1948, it just doesn't fit, it doesn't work. In, 12 month, in a 12 month period, they were able to conquer 80% of the country, displace almost a million people, destroy upwards of 500 towns and villages, and some of these towns were over a thousand years old. Destroy houses, destroy mosques, destroy hospitals, destroy schools. How were they able to do all this if they were being attacked from the outside? Accomplished so much in a 12 month period. Now, the Zionists couldn't claim that God was on their side because they were secular. These were Jews who left God in, outside in exile. Yet, at the end of 1948, beginning of 1949, of course, there was a Jewish state and there was a very, very serious refugee problem. The Palestinians who did remain in the country within Israel suddenly became, you know, from the owners of the land, they became these unwanted, this unwanted, discombobulated uh, community who are now living at the um, at the graces of the new landlord. And they were given the term the Arabs of Israel. In other words, they just happen to be Arabs and they happen to be in Israel. They have no other identity. They have no connection to the land. They're not Palestinians. They are Arabs of Israel, which means they live at the favor of Israel. And it's interesting, I was talking to, uh, I mentioned this the other day, I was, uh, had a really interesting conversation with an older Jewish couple in San Diego, big supporters of Israel and so on. And they were saying, well, you know, look at the Arabs in Israel, how well they're doing. In fact, they're doing so well that they don't even want to leave. You would be hard pressed to find a house, a school, a hospital, a highway, a shopping mall in any of the Palestinian communities within Israel that was built over the last 70 years. I don't know if zero investment, but very close to zero investment was made. While at the same time, towns and highways and malls and schools are being built all around them, but for Israeli Jews. The neglect that these communities suffer is criminal. The poverty levels are far below the national average of, uh, of, of the poverty levels within Israel. So somehow this myth, again, that, some, that they're somehow happy and that's why they don't leave. They don't leave it because it's their land. Um, and this is the reality, this is the reality which, which, which had uh, existed until, um, or since 19, the end of 1948. Now, this is my mother when she was young. She's 85 years old now. And one of the stories that she had always told me, and it exi it's, it's in the book. I, I put this story in the book because it's so moving and it was so important. I remember her telling me this story over and over again as a child. She was born and raised in Jerusalem. During the war, my father was fighting. He was an officer in the Palmach, in the Haganah. And um, she was living in a small apartment with her mother with two small children. Just for living with her mother and two small children in that apartment, she deserves a gold medal. But that's besides the point. She was, as, as, as the, uh, the Palestinian communities in West Jerusalem were being what they call cleansed, forced into exile, leaving, as they all left, their homes remained. And if you've been to Jerusalem, you know there are certain, there are certain neighborhoods where these homes are still there. These are beautiful homes, beautiful homes, with large gardens in the back and a lemon tree in the front. And she recalls, as a child, walking through these neighborhoods on a Saturday morning and seeing the families and so on. Well, when these homes became available, she was offered one of these homes. They were taken over by the Israeli forces, and they were offered to Israeli families who needed them. And of course, she had two young children and a husband in the front, in the front lines. So she was offered one of her homes. 
And her comment to me was, how could I possibly take the home of another mother? How can I take the home of another family? Can you imagine how much this family must miss their home? Living in exile as they do. And she would comment on the trucks, the Israeli trucks, full of loot driving by. She couldn't get over the shame. How were they not ashamed to drive around to take the loot this way and empty these homes? And as I was working on the book and as I was researching all this material, this story was in the back of my head the whole time. Of course, I spoke to her over and over again uh, over the last uh, months and, and days leading up to the book uh, to hear the story again. But what's interesting about this story is not only that she made a moral, a very moral decision at a very young age. I mean, think about it. You get a free home with no mortgage when you're 22 and you have two children. And you say no. But what she did, you know, for me uh, growing up, what she did was she placed the Palestinian on an even, on an even plateau with, with, with Israelis, with everybody else. In other words, if something is wrong, it's wrong. We shouldn't do it to anybody else. It's not because we're Israelis, it's okay for us. And this is very different from the way Israelis are taught about Palestinians, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But that was a very important, um, that was a very important part in, and I think, the formation of my point of view and in, in the formation of me as a person. Her story, and it also lends itself, of course, to the Palestinian narrative of what happened in 1948. I'm going to move ahead now, 20 years. This is my father. Uh, in the early 1960s, I mean, he remained in the, in, in the, in the Israeli army. Some of the militia, the Haganah, became the Israeli army after, after Israel was uh, established as a state. 20 years later, he was a general. And um, during this, the early to mid-60s, there was a sense that war was in the air again, that there was going to be war. And there was a huge military buildup in Israel. He was in charge of logistics and armaments. So he, uh, he had a big part in, in, the, in, the, um, in the military buildup on the Israeli side. And um, the story that we hear about 1967, we, hear it, we learn it in Israel, we hear it here all the time, this is the acceptable story, is that once again, the small state of Israel, the small Jewish state was attacked by Arab armies, intending to destroy it. And once again, miraculously, the small Jewish state was able to defeat and destroy three Arab armies, conquer huge tracts of land, tripled the size of the country, in fact, kill over 15,000 Arab soldiers, compared to 700 Israeli so uh, casualties that were killed, 15,000 in six days, and amass what was the biggest stockpile of Russian-made arms outside the Soviet Union at the time. And they did it in six days. And once again, they can't claim that it was God because these are secular people. But in the mythology of being Jewish and the mythology of being Israel, this fits very well because that's what happened in 48. That's what happened when the Maccabees fought the Greek. That's what happened with David and Goliath. This is a long line of victories, unlikely victories, that we as a minority have been able to achieve. So this is yet another one of them, because we are the descendants of the Maccabees and King David and so on. Now, a lot has been written about that period leading up to the Six-Day War. Israelis are, I think it's perfectly fair to say, obsessed with the days leading up to that war. Books upon books, documentaries upon documentaries, in Hebrew, in English, I'm sure in Arabic a lot has been written too. And so, as I was working on the book, I went to the Israeli archives, army archives, to take a look at my father's career. Actually, I actually have to give credit to Amir Haas who suggested that I do that. But I went in to see all about his career. I mean, he had a long military, interesting military career, but I was really intrigued about what actually took place. The, meet the minutes of the meetings leading up to the war are available. They're open. And so I went to read it. I mean, I've read all the other books and I didn't expect to find anything new, but you know, when you read them, as they come up, you actually see the minutes being, you know, the type, the typewriter, you know, the papers on, you know, the typewriter on the paper and so on. And, you know, it was my father's name coming up over and over again, saying all these things. It was interesting. Now, he did, he, his role in the push for war was, became something of a legend. He was one of two or three generals who were very persistent in getting, in pushing the Israeli cabinet to, um, to approve a preemptive strike and begin the war. 
And he said it not only in, did he say it in no uncertain terms, he probably crossed the line that the ge a general should cross when speaking to the prime minister, when speaking to ele the elected civilian government. He wasn't the only one, but he was, he, was, he was very outspoken. And that was kind of his legacy. So as I read the minutes of the meetings, several meetings, there was one item that I had never seen, I had never heard before. And that was where he claims, and other generals claim, that the Egyptian army is not prepared for war. That the Egyptian army is placing itself in danger by coming in close to us. Because what had happened, if you recall, the Egyptians, the uh, President Nasser kicked out the UN peacekeeping forces from the Sinai, brought Egyptian troops into the Sinai, which was supposed to be demilitarized, and threatened to close the Straits of Tehran to Israeli ships going up to Elat, which con constituted a breach of the ceasefire agreement between the two countries and really a cause for war. If you're a military man, the cabinet saw it differently. The cabinet thought, felt that it was important to pursue diplomatic means to end, the, to end this conflict. But I'd never seen that, that, that small item that the Egyptians were not prepared for war. The claim was the Egyptians are advancing an ill-prepared army. That they need at least a year and a half to two years in order to be prepared for war. And, the, and, and what he was blaming the prime minister with, with he said, your, your being hesitant is encouraging him to proceed. You, we need to be more assertive and you need to give us the, 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 the green light uh, to attack. And then he said, how dare you, how dare you doubt the ability of this army that had never lost in battle? Why do we have to suffer this disgrace, this army that has delivered so much? You know, the, the debate, the, 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 this tug of war between the two forces went on for, several, for some time. And of course, as we know, eventually the government, the Israeli cabinet did give the green light. The Israeli army attacked the Egyptians, destroyed the Egyptian army, took the Sinai in a matter of days, and then went on to take the West Bank and the Golan Heights. Another interesting fact that comes up is that the generals on their own decided to take the Golan Heights and the West Bank, not waiting for government approval. There was no reason that was not part of the plan. There was no such plan. This was something done, that was a decision that was taken by the generals themselves. But because it was so successful, of course, you know, nobody ever said anything. The West Bank was a sore spot for these, these Israeli generals who were young officers in 1948, and they felt it was a terrible shame, a big mistake that the West Bank wasn't taken in 48, because militarily Israel had the capability of doing it, but politically they decided not to. Ben Gurion decided not to. And they felt it was a sore spot for them. They felt it was an opportunity that was missed, and they wanted to finish the job, and that's what they did. Push the Israeli eastern boundary to the, goal, to the, to the Jordan River. And I, um, I have this great picture here. This is right after the victory. So just to read it once more, one more time, this country that we he hear about that was attacked by Arab armies in six days, tripled the size of the country, destroyed three Arab armies, killed over 15,000 soldiers, and was able to deliver for the first time after 2,000 years the entire land of Israel back to the Jewish people. And these are the young men, these are the young generals who did this. And the reason this picture is so interesting is because the man in the center, Zalman Shazar, was the president of the state of Israel in those days. And he, you know, the president is kind of a symbolic, uh, some symbolic post, uh, position in Israel, but he was a man who, who did a lot. He was, he was an important Zionist. He was a cabinet member before that. Uh, but he represents that older generation. And between the cabinet members and, and, the, and the generals, there was a generational thing. The cabinet members were all like him. They were older. They all came from exile. They came from Eastern Europe, most of them. They never touched a gun, never lifted a gun in their lives. And they raised these young generals, who by then were in their early 40s, to deliver. And they delivered. And here he is standing with these wonderful generals, these new Jews that had delivered the land of Israel, including what is considered the crown jewel, which is the old city of Jerusalem, back to Jewish hands. So from their perspective, this was a huge accomplishment. Historical accomplishment, hard to describe in words. But the fact remains that there was no attack and there was no threat. The notion of an existential threat was put out there by the military in order to pressure the cabinet. They knew 
there was no threat. They said there was no threat. Later on in years after the war, many of them admitted there was no threat. The, the, the whole notion of a threat was something that was developed for other reasons. And that the Egyptian army, by crossing the Suez Canal into the Sinai Peninsula, did not put Israel at threat. They put themselves at a threat because it allowed the Israeli army to destroy them and attack them. And you can imagine the lines of supplies into the desert and so on and so forth. This is 45 years ago. But then another interesting thing happened. On the day, on the very first meeting of the generals after the war, the very first weekly meeting that they had, the general staff, my father said, we now have an opportunity to solve the Palestinian problem once and for all. The local Palestinian leadership is prepared to negotiate a peace deal with Israel if we allow them to establish a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. In principle, Israel and the Zionist movement already accepted the notion of partition. These are our natural allies. It'll be the first Arab state that, to live in peace with Israel. And we have to take this opportunity to protect our own Jewish democracy. He said this over and over again. Eventually, Rabin, who was the chief of staff, took him aside and said, you know what, this is not the climate to talk about giving the land back. This is not the right political climate. What we know today is that immediately after the war, a huge settlement project began in, in, in expanding, the, expanding the boundaries of Jerusalem and in the West Bank and so on. A huge settlement expansion began pretty much right after the war was over with the intention to make those conquests irreversible, with the intention of making the conquest of the West Bank permanent. Basically, this is what happened in 1967. Palestine was erased, and the entire country became Israel. And by the way, when you look at Israeli uh, textbook, Israeli, you know, Israeli geography books and so on, or if you go on a trip on a hike in, in one of the natural reserves in Israel and you pick up a map, this is the map. This is Israel. The entire thing is Israel. Rarely will you ever find the name of a Palestinian town. Rarely will you see mentioned the Palestinian institution, like a university. Rarely will you see any information about Palestinian uh, population, and so on. This became Israel. And Palestine was wiped off the face of the earth. With one problem, of course, that there were still millions of Palestinians living there. My father went on, he retired in 1969, and then he went on to talk about the need for um, a resolution of the Palestinian problem through what we know today is called the two-state solution. And in the early, the, close to the, almost the mid-1970s, 1974, Yasser Arafat, who led the PLO, made a strategic decision, which was to explore the possibility of making peace with the Zionist state through a dialogue with Zionist Israelis like my father. And it was my father, Uri Avneri, several other prominent Zionists who felt that this was, this was the most important strategic objective that Israel has. To allow the Palestinians, a Palestinian state in the West Bank, so that we do not have to be an occupying power. So that we can maintain our Jewish democracy. This Jewish democracy, which, which they have fought so hard to achieve. One of the things my father said was, if we do not return, if we do not make peace with the Palestinians, if we do not allow them to, if we don't allow their, 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 their national desires to materialize, we will become an occupying power. This will have detrimental effects on the moral fiber of the state and on the moral fiber of the Israeli army, which will become inevitably a brutal occupying power because resistance is bound to develop. And when resistance develops, then the army has to, attack, you know, has to fight it and you get it yourself into this cycle of violence. The man he met with was Issam Sartawi. My dad's on the left, Dr. Sartawi is on the right. He was the Palestinian ambassador, the PLO ambassador to Paris. And for many, many years, as I'm sure some of you know, there was a wonderful dialogue, a very fruitful dialogue, except for one thing. On the Palestinian side, these were official delegates of the PLO. On the Israeli side, these were people who were actually renegades. The Israeli government was kept abreast of the, of the discussions but we had absolutely no interest whatsoever in pursuing a peace with the Palestinians or with anybody else for that matter. The change in Israeli policy began when it was absolutely certain that there was no 
chance in the world that a Palestinian state could actually be established. Once the investments and the settlements had made the West Bank a, an integral part of the rest of Israel, then you heard Israeli politicians like Rabin and Paris and so on, suddenly they had a willingness to talk about, to negotiate with the PLO. Suddenly they had a, uh, the, the, the willingness to negotiate and discuss a Palestinian state, but they knew for certain that a Palestinian state was no longer a viable possibility. How did they know? They created that reality. And I think it's important to note here, Israel is famous, I think, for its three no's. The three no's, and these are the three no's were established by the most moderate, peace, uh, peace-loving, or peace, uh, whatever, peaceful, um, peace-leaning Israeli governments. No to negotiating on the Jordan River Valley, which is about a third of the West Bank. No to negotiating the expanded boundaries of East Jerusalem, which is another 10, 15 percent of the West Bank. No to negotiating on the major uh, settlement blocks, which are a big chunk of the West Bank. And these three, three no's mean one thing. No to a Palestinian state. And when they knew for certain, when they knew for certain that this was not a possibility, then in the early 90s, and the mid-90s, Oslo, and so on and so on, then they began talking and negotiating. Two years after my father passed away, my family had its first encounter with terrorism, uh, where my niece, my sister's little girl, Smadar, was killed by suicide bombers. So she was in Jerusalem. It was September the 4th, right after school started. She, was, she went to buy schools, uh, school books with some friends. Two young Palestinians blew themselves up on Ben Yehuda Street. Now, this was big news for several reasons. Number one, she was the granddaughter of a famous general. Number two, she was the granddaughter of Mr. Peace with Palestine. So he was Mr. Peace in Palestine, and they showed him, didn't they? This was the attitude. And so my sister's apartment in Jerusalem was jam-packed with reporters and mourners and so on, but a lot of reporters from morning to night. And the first thing my sister said, well, she said two things. First thing she said was this, because she was asked about retaliation and revenge and so on. And she said, first of all, she said, no real mother would ever want this thing to happen to another mother. Don't talk to me about retaliation. And then she was asked, would she be willing to meet and talk with the other side? And she said, no. But the other side are not the Palestinians. The other side are Bibi Netanyahu, who was prime minister then, and the Israeli government, who brought these Palestinians to a point where they would kill themselves and take other civilians with them. The brutality of the occupation, the oppression of the people, the lack of hope with which these people have to live, with which these young Palestinians had to grow up, is what brought them to kill themselves and kill my daughter. And therefore, I point a finger at my own government. And I will not discuss, and I will not talk to them, because they are the other side. Now this, of course, created even more news, and more reporters came. And the LA Times suddenly wrote about her, and the, and the New York Times, and everybody. This is a big deal. But she put us all on a path. She put the entire family on a path, which me living in the US at that time forced me to suddenly stop and think, I want to do something too. Something has to be done. We all have to do something. Now, it's very easy for me, not easy, but it's easier, relatively easy for me to come here and talk like this today. Many of you who are, who are Jewish would know that this is actually very difficult to say as a Jewish person, to criticize Israel like this, to admit the crimes of the state of Israel, to admit the crimes of the IDF, uh, to realize that the state of Israel is actually capable of these things, that this wonderful myth that Israel is a wonderful Jewish, a wonderful democracy that is always being attacked, that is always under, under threat, is a lot easier. And this is what we were born to believe. This is what, I'm sorry, raised to believe. Um, and the good fortune that I had was that in San Diego there was a Jewish-Palestinian dialogue group which I decided to join. And it was in that environment that I began to hear about the Palestinian narrative. So it wasn't in, a, you know, in some kind of a debate where somebody was pointing their finger and saying, well, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. We accuse you because you're an Israeli. It was, here is what happened to my family, here's what happened to me, here's what happened to my grandparents which is an entirely different thing. And that is how I learned. Of course, it was not easy. It was painful and difficult. But that was 
uh, that was the process by which I, I, um, I really began that journey. And I was born and raised in Israel, and in San Diego in the year 2000 was the first time I ever sat with Palestinians, ever actually met and sat with Palestinians in a normal setting to just talk. You know, the claim is that Jerusalem became united and mixed. It's united, it's mixed, but it's also very segregated. So Israelis and Palestinians never actually do anything together, and they never meet each other. So I began, you know, I began with dialogue in San Diego, and then I, and then I ventured into the West Bank, and I ventured into Palestinian communities within Israel to learn more, and that was kind of my, that was the, the, the beginning of my journey. And one of the things that I saw, one of the first things that I noticed was as I was going into the Palestinian territories, at every point there was this big sign right by the checkpoint. Now notice the, whole, the sign is in Hebrew. It's huge. It's white over red. And it reads this way. It says, this road leads into area A, which is under Palestinian control. Entry for Israelis into area A is forbidden. It risk, it's, it's a, a, you know, it risks your life. It endangers your life. And it is a felony. Two exclamation marks. So the fact that it you know, endangers your life and is a felony wasn't enough to stop you. The two exclamation marks will for sure. <laughs> and this is only in Hebrew. In other words, it only endangers you, your life if you're an Israeli. So if you're a sensible person, you take a look and you go home. You turn around, you walk back. I mean, who would go through this? It's dangerous. There's probably food, uh, you know, shooting and fighting and who knows what on the other side, right? And then you find yourself in Ramallah or in Elbire or in Bethlehem and you go, there's people here <laughs> and there's schools here and people go to work and there's traffic jams and taxis and you know, markets. And the thought began to develop in my mind, perhaps this was by design. Perhaps somebody does not want to see reconciliation. Somebody does not want to see the two sides meet. This is a new sign. Notice that it's also in Hebrew. I'm sure many of you have heard of Bil'in and Abi Salah, these, these, these towns, these villages where there's a con there an ongoing um, nonviolent resistance every single week. So this, is, this road is called the Apartheid Road. It's Route 443, I think it's called. And the sign said that by, command of the, by uh, order of the commanding general, the commanding officer, there's a prohibition on Israelis and Israeli vehicles to enter the villages in the area, the Palestinian villages in the area. Mind you, the road goes into settlements, and that's fine. There's no danger there. But they prohibit, the prohibition is to go into Palestinian villages knowing that Israelis go there in order to participate. So what is the point of all this? If we never get together, how are we going to solve this? Which is exactly the point. Solving it is not part of, the, of, the, of, of what Israel wants to achieve. I have this picture here. This is another story in the book where I, um, this is a good friend of mine who sat in prison for many, many years for killing two soldiers, stabbing to death two soldiers. Now, I was a soldier. And the story and the way with which he was able, he and a few others were able to, uh, um, to come up and kill two fully armed, fully equipped Israeli soldiers on guard. In other words, they were on guard somewhere and in some spot in some you know, post with knives. And the question that beckons is, well, well, who's the terrorist here? Well, obviously he's a terrorist. He sat in prison. The only reason he's out of prison is because he was released in one of these big prisoner exchanges that Israel had conducted with PLO. But if you look at international law, he's not a terrorist. Because armed resistance against uh, a racist, oppressive occupation is legal. And being part of an occupying army and maintaining an entire population under a brutal occupation is illegal. He's not the terrorist, I am. And of course he sat in prison. And one of the things that uh, Jamal was able to do was show me a lot about the prisoner. And you cannot talk about Palestine without talking about the prisoners. Without talking about the prisoners movement. Thousands upon thousands of Palestinians have still sit in Israeli prison in violation of international law. Over 90% of them are not charged or accused of any violent crime. Over 90% of the Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons are not charged for violent crimes. These are political prisoners. And this is because the majority of Palestinian resistance is not violent. This is a reflection of the reality which people often forget to notice. It's another one of those double standard myths, one of these lies that Palestinian resistance means violence, that Palestinians are terrorists. The vast majority of Palestinian resistance to Israel has always been nonviolent. 
And this man, his name is Abu Ali Shaheen. I, he's, he's one chapter before last. He was pretty much, I met him through Jamal at the very, very late in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the project. And he was, he was the Fatah, uh, he was commander of the southern commander, uh, he was the Fatah commander of the southern part of Israel leading up to the, in 1967. And after the 1967 war, he and Yasser Arafat toured the country up and down to look at the cells and to look at the resistance and so on and so forth. And he was caught and put in prison. And he, he was probably number two or number three on Israel's you know, most wanted list. Uh, he was caught, he was put in prison, he was tortured, he, was, he sat in, in solitary confinement for almost 20 years. And when I, I, the reason I met him is because he was, he, I was told that he went and visited my father's grave. And I'd never heard of him. I thought, why did he visit my father's grave? So I met him, and over several days I recorded him and talked about him. And his point was this. Your father, with his insistence that Israel must respect Palestinian rights, washed the pain and washed the anger from my heart as a Palestinian who suffered the occupation, who suffered the massacres, who suffered all the injustice that Israel had uh, placed upon my people. He was still in prison for many years after that. But after he was released, on his own, he would go and visit my father's grave. And he, there's another couple of stories in the book that kind of connect him with my father. You'll have to read the book. It's actually a very good story um, about Abu Ali Shaheen. And he was the leader from the prison. All of us, have probably, many of you probably read Nelson Mandela's stories about how he led you know, the ANC from prison. He led the prisoner's movement and accomplished amazing things. And if you don't know about the, the Palestinian prisoners movement, you need to educate yourself because it is one of the most remarkable achievements of Palestinian society and Palestinians as a people. And then the very last part of my book is the very last chapter talks about how do these two nations share a country? Because the reality is half the population or close to half the population are Palestinians and maybe a little bit over the half are Israelis. Projections are that in 20 years, the Palestinians will be a majority. No one's going away. The way this country is run right now is everybody is governed by one government. So it's one state. There's no question about that. There's one government that governs the lives of every single person there. It's the Israeli government. They have laws for Israeli Jews, which are liberal, you know, democratic laws. They have laws for Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, which are completely different laws. There's a lot of legalized discrimination and cultural discrimination against them. And then there are the laws that govern the lives of the people in the West Bank and Gaza, which are horrendous laws, military laws, where they are governed by the military and there is no law that protects them. The only way that we get out of this that I can see, the only way that we move forward to the benefit of both sides is complete equal rights, a complete transformation from the Zionist racist state that exists today to a real pluralistic democracy where there are equal rights for everybody. That is the way forward. And I believe that people of conscience, people who believe in peace, people who want to see this problem solved need to focus their energies on accomplishing that. Because that promises a bright future for both Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. I had the pleasure of meeting your sister and doing interviews with her. Oh, it's a great honor. Um, you kind of summed everything up in the last two sentences about what was needed, but Israel is so separated right now. I mean, the, the right and the left, and the left is so outnumbered. How does that become possible? Uh, do you think the same kind of um, scenario that occurred pre-67 is now occurring under Netanyahu as there is this hysterical saber rattling of war against Iran, which top Israeli military and intelligence mm. officers okay. are decrying? Yeah. Okay, let's do three and then we'll do another three. Um, the best things Americans can do, I agree completely that one of the best things certainly uh, people can do is go there and and um, pay for it yourself, and then travel on your own to places that perhaps, if it was an organized tour, you won't be able to see. Cross the checkpoints, go through that experience, see what it's like on the Palestinian side, talk to people, go to refugee camps. Um, 
Definitely, that's very, very important. I think, uh, beyond, so basically, educating yourself and educating others. I mean, one of the purposes of putting this together was to provide information. And I'm told that with, with the background that I bring forward, to, that I bring to the table, the things I have to say ha carry some weight. So, you know, if you've read the book, give it to somebody else and use this information, use this information to educate your friends. You know, maybe get a book for all your friends as well. This is very, very important. The problem, one of the problems in America is that there is such a gap in, in, in what Americans know. There is such an unbelievable gap. If you compare Europeans to what they know about the Middle East and Americans, regardless of what they think about it, but just the basic ability to, to conduct an intelligent conversation based on the reality is very difficult with Americans because they don't know. So educating people is important. Learn about the BDS. Learn about the BDS. It's not a perfect organization, but the notion, the basic idea of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel is a good one. It's an important one. Israelis want to be liked. They are very offended when people don't like them. People say, oh, the BDS isn't working. It's working fine. Just keep at it. Go on and put those labels on Israeli products so people know these are apartheid products. You know, when the Israeli symphony shows up, stand outside and pick it. So I think those are some of the things, certainly some of the things Americans can do and are important to do. Um, how is it possible? I mean, I don't know how it's possible. You know, if anybody said four or five years ago, how is it going to be possible to get rid of Mubarak? Would we be able to somehow bring together this popular revolution that would get rid of this monster, who was certainly as bad as Saddam Hussein, if not worse? Uh, people say, there's no way. He's well armed, he's, he's well financed by the US, there is no way to get rid of Mubarak. If anybody said several years before apartheid fell in South Africa, is it possible? People said it's not possible. So exactly how it's going to work, I don't know. We do know that there are, um, there, there, there exists a series of processes which bring evil regimes to fall. And Zionism is one of those evil regimes that needs to fall and be transformed into a real democracy. Uh, it happened in South America with fascist dictatorships in South America. Um, I think the important thing is to stay focused that that is the objective. That transforming Israel into a real democracy is the objective. Not this two-state nonsense because it's no longer possible. Um, and then to, um, and then like again, go back to BDS, educate people, talk about it, go there, protest, support the Palestinian uh, popular resistance in any way you can. Those are the ways, that, and, that's, and that's how these things uh, come to be as far as I know. Um, definitely the Iran thing. You know, people ask me about Iran, I say, remember the WMD in Iraq? Have we all suddenly forgotten? I think there was a, somebody talking here, I think there's something happening here about Iran, and that's the caption I saw on your website. You know, are we all suffering from this amnesia? Did we forget the WMD in Iraq? Iran is a smokescreen so that people will not talk about Palestine. Absolutely, and without any doubt. Iran is a smokescreen. Israel has had wonderful trade relations with Iran, even with the Hayatollahs. And that's a well-known fact. If you remember the Iran-Contra, everything went through Israel. The ships of, of, of the conglomerate of, of, of the Ofer family, which is one of the richest, if not the richest, family in Israel, were spotted in Iran, loading and unloading, less than a, you know, six months ago. It was in Haaretz. Iran has never, you know, as far as we know, attacked or, or, or occupied anybody, not any time not anytime recently. This whole thing is to divert attention from the Palestinian issue, from the horrific crimes committed by Israel against its pop Palestinian population. When people talk about Iran, bring the conversation back to Palestine. Absolutely. Let's go here with the gentleman over here, then we'll come across to the other side of the room. I see a lot of young people here, so you guys, I hope you have some questions too. It's nice to see so many young people. Do we have a microphone that we're somewhere? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, I was just wondering, in 1947, when the UN was going along with this establishing a nation for Israel, um, what, if any, was the representation of the Palestinian people there to speak for themselves? Was there anybody there at all, or um, were they caught un unrepresented? Okay, another one. 
I'm just curious uh, how you uh, reconcile your um, one democratic state solution with this international consensus, uh, more or less a consensus around the two-state solution, and the fact that a lot of people do see that as the way. Well, uh, thank you so much to the Palestinian Center here. The work they do for peace with justice is uh, peerless. And thank you to the speaker. And I do have uh, a clarification before I ask the question. I couldn't hear well when you mentioned that 7,000 years ago all died. Could you clarify that? And related to that, are there any statistics that show what was the percentage of uh, people of the Jewish religion in what is now called by the Zionist Israel. Oh, what really? Was the, what was the percentage right? Uh, when? Like the beginning of the 20th century, for instance. Oh, okay. Uh, of, of people of the Jewish faith in what the Israelis call, or the Zionists call now Israel. And uh, second, do you see a tendency of more and more people in Israel to differentiate uh, clearly between Zionism and uh, Judaism? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get started here. Um, you know, like I said, the crowning achievement of the Zionist diplomatic corps was the, the, the was United Re Na Nations resolution, and it's 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 a bigger bigger issue than you know the it's, the scope that's required to talk about it is, is 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 this is not enough for it. So, what I will say is this: uh, if you read Ilan Pape, if you read Avishlam, if you read some of the people that have written about this. Uh, it's an extraordinary story of, of deceit and, and, and um, well, may, perhaps it's diplomacy, I don't know. Perhaps it's, it's legitimate diplomacy. But uh, the efforts that the Zionist diplomatic corps had gone through in order to accomplish uh, this resolution or to get this resolution to pass is quite extraordinary. So it's an excellent question and it's an excellent topic. I, I just, I don't think this is, you know, I don't have the time to really uh, get into it. But it's definitely something worth worth learning about. It was, it was, unbe it was really quite quite impressive. Um, no, you're absolutely right. This is, this is absolutely the, the issue of the, is there a consensus? Of course there's a consensus for a two-state solution. Um, and this is the absurdity of the situation. The, most, the, the solution that most people, or that is commonly regarded as the best solution, is impossible. Is impossible, and it was and be made impossible by design over 45 years by Israeli governments. But in order to realize this, you have to look deeper. And most people prefer, I think, not to. And it's very easy. Look, the things that I say are very difficult for people who have any regard for Israel. Very difficult to hear and even more difficult to accept. The transformation of Israel into a real democratic state means that it's not going to be a Jewish state, that there will not be a Jewish state. For a lot of Jews, and for a lot of people who like Israel, this is, this, you know, they compare it to, they say, oh, it's genocide. Which is nonsense, of course, because nobody's talking about genocide, nobody's talking about violence. We're talking about, you know, giving rights to everybody that lives there. You know, perhaps a Jewish state and the perfect division between Jews and Palestinians would be possible somewhere else. Perhaps a homogenous Jewish state would be possible somewhere else. In this particular country, there are two nations, half the population is not Jewish, and they're completely mixed. There is no area right now that you can partition and say, well, this will be Palestine, this will be Israel. Uh, and it doesn't really resolve much of the problems. We've got a refugee problem, we've got the Palestinians inside Israel. It is, it is not going to solve any of the problems. Um, and it is, not a re it is not a possible solution by any, any, shape, uh, any way, shape, or form. But a lot of people don't want to talk about this notion that Israel will become you know, Israel-Palestine and that there won't be a Jewish state. It will be a state of the Jews, it will be a state of the Palestinians. Um, and I think that's why the consensus is still there. But I think it's moving in the right direction. I think it's moving away from that as people learn more and more about this. Um, when I said the people died, what I said in the beginning was that you know, Zionism talked about bringing Jews back to their homeland, but the actual Jews who were exiled thousands of years ago had passed away already. It's not the same people. That's what I meant. Um, and I think the differentiation that you made between what it means to be Jewish and what it means to be Zionist is a very important distinction. And I think what, one of the terrible things that happen here in Jewish communities in America 
is that they became Zionist because they lost their humanity and they lost their Jewish values. I'll give you an example. I know we're short on time, but I'll give you an example of the vast, the vast difference between Jewish values and Zionist values. I'm sure all of you recall December 27th, 2008, when Israel began its assault on Gaza. A 21-day massive military assault against a completely civilian population. A civilian population never had a tank, never had a warplane, never had an artillery battery, has no shelters, and where there are 800,000 children present. On the very first day, Israel dropped 100 tons of bombs on the first day of a 21-day assault from the air. I don't know if you know this, a one-ton bomb will destroy a city block. 100 tons of bombs on the first day on one of the most heavily, one of the most densely populated regions in the world and very small geographically. And this was the first day. What were they thinking they were going to accomplish? What could they possibly accomplish but carnage? What could they possibly accomplish except killing innocent people? Nothing. Several days later, the ground forces came in. And if you, see, if you saw pictures, you saw the ground forces preparing to enter. Rows and rows of tanks and rows of, arms, rows of armored personnel carriers bringing in the troops, the paratroopers. There is no army in Gaza. You'd think they were preparing for World War II all over again, that the, the Russian army was there or something. There is no army in Gaza. Never was. Palestinians have always been a completely civilian population. This is Zionist values. And after this happened, you know, I've been talking for a lot of, uh, I've been, I, I, I spoke very, very strongly against Israel, of course, as this happened. And I reminded particularly Jewish people who defended Israel, who defended this, this, this horrific crime of a story in, um, in Genesis where God wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham walks up to God, and you should read the description. It's so dramatic. He walks up to God and he says, will you also kill the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? And God says, if there are 50, I will not destroy the city. And then, and then Abraham negotiates down and down and down. And he's relentless. That is Jewish values. You do not destroy a city. 800,000 children to expose them to phosphorus, to the poisons, to the wreckage, to the fear, to the noise, to the fires. And nowhere to go, nowhere to hide, nowhere to, nowhere, nowhere to run to. There's a vast difference between what it means to be Jewish and Jewish values and what it means to be a Zionist and Zionist values. Miko, thank you very much. Uh, everyone, of course, you know that the book is, is uh, available here. Uh, and I'll remind those, again, viewing online, you could purchase them at justworldbooks.com. Uh, and and Miko is going to sign some copies for us in the back. So uh, join me in, in thanking our speaker today and then join us in the back. Thank you. Thank you.